Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bob Barish, the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, and welcome to another installment of the 2022 UI Health Distinguished Scholar Series. The Office of the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs is pleased to present this collaboration among population health sciences, the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Clinical Officer, Chief, Chief Nursing Officer, Chief Quality Officer, and Chief Diversity and Community Health Equity Officer. This series is intended to offer an opportunity to learn from and share with nationally recognized healthcare leaders. So I would really like to offer a very special welcome to our distinguished guest from the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Patricia Flatley Brennan. And I know uh, Patricia, you go by Patty. Uh, she currently serves as the director of the National Library of Medicine. So thank you for taking your time out of your extremely busy schedule to share your experience and expertise with us today. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time, Patty. It's been very exciting to see this uh, seminar series uh, come to fruition. Some time ago, I approached Dr. Krishnan and others with the idea to engage healthcare thought leaders from across the nation in meaningful conversations that we may share their experience with our local community to better serve our patients. We wanted to get rid of traditional slide presentations and host more intimate conversations with notable experts that can inform our operations and healthcare delivery. Today's conversation is an exceptional opportunity to engage with a national leader from the NIH, especially in the areas of healthcare innovation and leadership. In our own pursuit of training the future leaders in health and medicine, we're certainly to learn and gain deeper insights into this aim through the experiences of Dr. Flatley Brennan. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome our UI Health Distinguished Scholar, Dr. Flatley Brennan or Patty for this virtual fireside chat. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to our Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. Shelley Major for a brief introduction of our featured speaker, Dr. Major. Thank you, Dr. Barish, and welcome everyone. I'm Shelley Major, I'm the Chief Clinical Operations Officer, and it is my distinct pleasure uh, to be able to introduce our um, speaker today and our honoree, um, Patty, Brennan is a nurse and is the director of the National Library of Medicine. She is, um, it, it's one of 27 institutes at the center of the National Institutes of Health. And she assumed this position in August of 2016. She's had this position and it's a data science at the National Institute of Health and a, a national, and she's a an, an, national and international leader in her field. Her professional accomplishments reflect her background, which include engineering, information technology, and clinical care to improve public health and to ensure that the best possible experience for patients in their care. She received her master's degree in nursing from the University of Pennsylvania and her PhD in industrial engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in 2020, Dr. Brennan was inducted in the American Institute for Medical and Bio biological engineering. And um, the fellows in this area are the highest professional distinctions awarded to medical and biological engineers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Again, welcome, uh, Dr. Brennan. I'm going to turn it over to our panelists um, to introduce themselves. First, Dr. Bleasdale. Hello, Dr. Brennan. I'm Susan Bleasdale. Uh, I'm an infectious disease physician and the chief quality officer here at UI Health. Welcome. I'm excited for our conversation. Great. Uh, good morning, Krishnan. everyone. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Patty, nice to see you. Um, I'm Jerry Christian. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Population Health Sciences, and thank you for joining, with, uh, joining us today. Ronnie. Good afternoon. I'm Ronnie Morrison, uh, the Chief Diversity and Community Health Equity Officer here at UI Health, and it's a pleasure. So welcome everyone, and I do want to encourage everyone to please use the Q&A button uh, for any questions that you have um, during this discussion. During registration, many of you submitted questions that we have incorporated into our questions as well. So this event is being recorded and is available on the Distinguished Scholar website. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and start our first question, um, Patty, um, and, and that is, could you please share with us um, your leadership journey as you have aspired into 
this role uh, in the LMN director and what inspires you in your daily work? I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I wanna thank my colleagues for spending the time with me preparing for this in this afternoon's time together. I also thank those of you who are listening for your input, your ideas, and I'm looking forward to some questions in the Q&A later in this hour so we can have even a little bit more of a dialogue. Uh, I have to say my leadership journey began uh, 69 years ago when I was born as the second child of 10 in a family in West Philadelphia. And you learn in a family of 10 to speak loud, speak often, and get to the table first. So those personal experiences in getting me started actually proved to be quite helpful. Uh, speaking loud doesn't always work, but speaking with a, a voice that projects loudly and with a voice that has a message that is loud is actually a critical part of my leadership journey. I lead for a purpose. Uh, secondly, um, speaking often, positioning ourselves as particularly as nurses and as engineers moving into healthcare, we don't often get invited. We need to find our way to the table and get a good seat. And that is a, that's an individual op opportunity. Finding that way in often means finding partnerships, finding mentors, finding powerful elders to bring us along. My leadership journey began uh, professionally around 1976 when I was a practicing psychiatric nurse and realized that you can do a lot one-to-one -one with a patient, but you can do even more when you lead a group of nurses. So I moved into early leadership roles uh, in psychiatric nursing in the late 70s. During the period of time, there was deinstitutionalization of mental health patients. Uh, moving into the community. Why that is, that's important is it became uh, my first realization of the intersection of policy, of patients' experiences, of clinical knowledge, and interestingly enough, technologies, because computers were just coming into play in the late 70s. Um, no one really thought they would come into play as they have, but recognizing that that intersection might be a powerful way to lead. So uh, through the 80s and early 90s, I developed my research programs around using computers to extend the practice of nursing into people's homes, using computers to help both nurses and patients make decisions. It's not possible for everyone to be Irish and clairvoyant. So we need to find some way for help people, helping people to envision a future action consequences of their decisions in the present time. And to me, that's what technology allowed us to do. Throughout my work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 96 to 2016, I did a lot of my leadership on the side, that is as a scholar, bringing research teams together. Um, we happen to have been a particularly successful group at research grants, and that allowed us to bring new people into the process. But importantly, I learned the importance of faculty governance, and I learned the importance of aligning the governance roles of faculty with the administrative and management leadership roles of the campus. Again, because Wisconsin was a, uh, is, is a state university, we worked quite closely with the state government, not always in a friendly manner, but often to improve the health of the citizens of Wisconsin through the educational interventions. I actually became the director of the National Library of Medicine a bit as a second career. I had planned to retire in my early 60s, driving by, driven by a personal vision to end homelessness in Wisconsin, and had started to put in place coalitions of businesses and of, of practicing clinicians, as well as of civic groups, to see how we could move towards a level of homelessness that would be acceptable and support the city. Um, and then I got the call from a colleague here at NIH, you should consider this position. Now the director of the National Library of Medicine had been in his role since my career began, actually before my PhD was even completed. Dr. Lindbergh was in his position for 31 years. And so I never aspired to this role because it never was, was open to me, was open to anyone. So it never, didn't occur to me, I was ready to move on out, out of a professional healthcare uh, environment into more social care. But the challenges of changing the lives of people requires us to rethink the concept of health. And where better can you rethink the concept of health than directing a library where the terms and the literature and ideas that we pull together around health can be expanded by the integration of social determinants of health. So I saw the opportunity to lead the National Library of Medicine as an opportunity to reach, achieve my personal values, my personal goals to improve the health of everyone through better understanding of health. 
I also had believed after 20 years at Wisconsin, I understood government operations. I knew how to get around through and over government issues. So I could be all right. I wasn't quite prepared for that. And so we'll have a chance to chat later about some of the things that helped me in my everyday work here. But what inspires me is that we are about good. The government provides support and information for people, for policymakers, for scientists to improve their work. And that is the mission of the National Library of Medicine. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Our next question, um, we've had a very storied career as we've heard from your bio um, and even what you shared just now. Um, what are your reflections? You talked a little bit about some of your leadership journey, but what are your reflections on you as a leader um, and a female role model in particular? Well, I'm a great convert to the belief that you can be what you can see. So as a female leader, I put myself in very public places, talking to schools, to church groups, to policymakers, to show that leadership looks like this. I believe that it is important to uh, be present in conversation. And that's been a challenge in the last couple of years because my, I'm a large woman and my physical presence is commanding in a room. But on Zoom, you couldn't use that quite as much. So I needed to learn other techniques and other tools. I believe that leadership is learned and it, it complements who we are as individuals. Most people do not are not born as leaders, but we bring together the resources of our lives to knit our own style of leadership. My style of leadership is team oriented. I have uh, nine direct reports who meet together every other week, working towards a concept of one NLM, moving away from the idea that divisions and silos or what we might've called in universities, departments and centers can operate on their own because they operate, first of all, on a shared infrastructure, and secondly, may add efficiencies to other groups if, there are, if the common problems are identified and common solutions are made. So my leadership is one of team building, of conversation, and of, of shared mission. I believe quite strongly in my role as a leader is to provide the space and the resources for those who work in my operations to be the best that they can be. That requires building models of accountability. It also requires clever resource acquisition. I have yet to meet an opportunity that I haven't been able to try just a little bit to get a little more money out of. And I trace this way back to my father who worked for the Catholic missions for my whole time growing up. So I know how to get money out of people. What's important though, is that the getting of the money is not the, is not the, the end point, it's the beginning that enables us to operate. And I have to recognize as a leader who believes in, in this concept of shared identity, that when I move funds from one area to another, I'm actually, it's in, in essence, asking one area, one area to give up to another. So I have to both build the one who is getting as well as the one who is giving to make this leadership model work. I believe, uh, leadership requires integrity. We can't become integral people with integrity alone. We need to be in interaction with others around us. We need to be constantly questioning and checking, are we being heard the way we want to be heard? And if we're not, how do we make that change? Finally, I believe that leadership does not happen alone. As I've said several times, the people who've accompanied me on my leadership journey have been certainly teachers and mentors, particularly national mentors around the country. I have mentors across the disciplines, which has helped me understand how I'm heard in different disciplines. My students and trainees have been critically important in terms of moving my journey forward because among other things, when you look at 20 year olds, you begin to think you must look like 20 year olds. And so you constantly feel youthful and engaged and that in itself keeps you energized. Most importantly though, I, as I said in the very beginning, I lead for a purpose. So the participants, the patients, the stakeholders that we serve, even though I don't see them every day are part of my leadership journey and part of my conversation in my soul to bring leadership to our needs. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from, um, from something that was submitted by one of our staff, June Dyson, one of our AN3s from Interventional Radiology asks, you're a nurse and an engineer, and that's awesome. How did you stumble into engineering and how did this change your views in nursing and medicine in general? 
Thanks very much for the question. And uh, stumble is actually a fairly apt way of characterizing this. I'd like to tell you that I, I planned all this and it happened exactly the way I planned, um, but it didn't. Um, at the same time though, uh, nursing and engineering are actually quite similar professions. They both use technologies to improve human function. Now they use different kinds of technologies. Nursing uses biochemical technologies, the therapeutic use of self, maybe physical motion, maybe environmental manipulation, but we use technologies to improve health. In engineering, we use technologies, but they're different. They're mathematical models, they're physical models. They're understanding the structure of, of materials and bringing that to bear on the particular problem we have. Both but industrial engineering is very, very similar to nursing in the following way. Industrial engineering believes that the technology should meet, but not supplant the human engagement in any kind of work operation system, whether it's a factory or a spaceship or a hospital. Nursing comes forward from the idea brought to us by Virginia Henderson that we do only for the person what they would or could do for themselves had they the will, the skill, or the ability. So we never try to obliterate or overwhelm the human function, but rather support it. Now, um, I, that insight came over the period of time from about 75 to 85, as I was still in the formative period of studying and understanding. What I will tell you that's happened over the longer period of time is that being a nurse has developed my ability to do assessments in the most amazingly deep way possible. Nursing begins always with assessment, looking for the strength in the other. Being an engineer is a problem solving tool. And we learn about how to find the common features of a problem to apply it to multiple or to know when it can't be applied to other circumstances. So the synergy between nursing and engineering has been particularly helpful in my career. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that the engineering brought a little greater remuneration than the nursing part did. So I had a little more access to resources. I had a little more access to salary growth. I had a little more access to uh, different kinds of research opportunities because of my engineering. And now as a, a leader of a very large 1700 person workforce at the National Institutes of Health, my engineering background helps me understand the systems quick enough so we can make both responses in planning for the future, as well as adjustments in planning in the moment. Patty, our next question also comes from um, our attendees today. So um, from Carolyn Dickens, who's the Interim Associate Dean for Faculty Practice and Partnerships um, and a nurse. Uh, Carolyn has asked, in your educational training, what did you find most helpful for this position, nursing or engineering? You know, I have a hard time separating that as I look back over 40 years. Um, if I didn't have the basic foundations of nursing, which covers physiology, psychology, sociology, I wouldn't have this the framework that it could let me understand how delivering health information into a community sometimes requires delivering it to a mother or delivering it to a church group, not delivering it to an individual. So I, 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 under, I understand from what I know in nursing, I have language for the strategic directions that we're taking in at the, the, at the National Library of Medicine. Um, the engineering part has brought me a, a, a way of thinking that allows me to do pretty deep problem solving pretty quickly. I have good analytic skills. I have models, or I have, if you will, different languages I can use. So I can talk about the use of portfolio analysis, which is a technique that often investments investors use to determine a return on investment when the return covers a number of different kinds of values. I can talk about that as good ways to measure the impact of clinical interventions on patient outcomes when we might improve self-concept, improve the ability for someone to take care of themselves and to make good choices. So I find it, I find I can move uh, te techniques and, and ideas that are common in one discipline over to the other discipline. Um, engineering teaches you to fail often. I encourage you to fail early, but it teaches you to have ways of understanding your failures. Um, and that had, we, we saw that in our, my graduate education, um, where uh, if a program failed, it was e e equally important for you to be able to explain why it failed than to demonstrate that you could make it work in the end. Um, in, the, in the case of nursing, however, what we learn in nursing is the power of presence. 
So when we are with individuals at their intimate moments of life, we are there about them, not about us. And it doesn't matter what we know or how correct we are or how right we are. It matters that we be present. So combining the ideas of being present and failing early but understanding it allows me to take better risks in my career. It allows, my, I shouldn't say better, it allows me to take more risks and survive them. And it also allows me to develop in others the willingness to fail without it being a, an experience of shame or an experience of embarrassment. Thank you so much, Patty. And you know, you, you've already shared with us a, a lot of information about your leadership style and, and the position that you hold. And I'm sure that you have to make a lot of decisions uh, as an institute director. How do you, how do you prioritize among all those decisions, particularly as it relates to research. Um, what is your approach to setting research priorities? So that's an excellent question. The National Library of Medicine has two research operations. We have an intramural research program. That's about a $30 million a year operation. And it focuses on computational biology and computational clinical health sciences. In our extramural program, which are the funds that we provide around the country uh, to research universities, to institutes, um, to, uh, to uh, uh, private sector, uh, those funds support a broad range of activities, including exploration of new methods and models, such as artificial intelligence interpretations, new approaches to delivering information. And we even have a small but important venture fund for innovation for, for small business. Now, some of my decisions are out of my hands, frankly. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it's really true that when, uh, when I joined the National Library of Medicine, we already had a strong tradition in our extramural program that we supported university-based post predoctoral and postdoctoral training in biomedical informatics. Now, some of that was in uh, schools of medicine. Some of that was more broadly across universities. And so when I came, I, I needed to respect the long tradition of the, but we, we use a different mechanism than the, the T32, the more common NIH funded model. We use a T15 mechanism. So I needed to, to respect what was in place and, and not, not um, and determine how to make, to orient it to the future. Um, so I spent my first two years visiting every training program we had in the country, understanding what we needed, how we were doing, how are we making the, the progress we need. And what I learned is that we were doing some tremendous training but fully half of our trainees were going to industry. So we were decimating the professoriate. So I spent time now working with my extramural program staff to investigate ways to stimulate interest in mentorship and training and educational opportunities, and to ensure that our trainees saw that there was a valued and valuable career track into the, the healthcare and biomedical informatics community. Um, we also, we, they look for priorities for research. We're guided very much by our, our research review committee. That is, we have a standing committee within the National Library of Medicine who guides us in, in evaluating and prioritization of research and research proposals. And while we're, we, are, um, uh, we are advised by them, we're not bound by them. So what that means is we still have to overlay considerations such as programmatic directions, um, appropriateness of the, the or novelty of the, of the process relative to the rest of our portfolio, the fit with our portfolio. So I would say that I spend a fair amount of my research prioritization with one eye on the field and where it's going or where I'd like it to go, and one eye on the balance of our portfolio to make sure that our investments actually move the field forward. Um, well, you can have a super, super research program, a research project proposal that gets a wonderful score, but doesn't really ad address a gap or move into a brand new area. And our research budget is fairly small relative to other institutes. Our budget, uh, we must be making sure that our investments are investments for the future. I need to think to speak with you about a couple of other issues. One of them is when you control health information, you control how we characterize patients. So increasingly, as we look at our research programs, 
that identify decision support, for example, or Nigam Shaw's gorgeous work on how to get uh, consultations in the moment into clinicians' hands. We need to make sure that the tools and technologies that our investigators are proposing are appropriately appraised for their ability to ensure understanding, completeness, lack of bias, and relevance to the clinical problem at hand. Having a perfect solution to an imperfect patient just frankly doesn't work. So some of my research priorities are less thematic and more process oriented. Are we actually reaching where we need to reach? The, we, the National Library of Medicine supports the NIH as a whole in their focus on expanding the access to re, federally funded research for young investigators, what we call our early stage investigators. So we make sure as we look at our proposals that we are reaching to young people who are in their late 20s and early 30s. You may be well aware of the statistic that says the, the, early, the, most, the average age for achieving an NIH funded research project is 42. That's too late. That's not, that's not gonna, we could lose so many young investigators by that time. So we're looking to balance our portfolio, making sure that we reach to our young investigators. The National Library of Medicine is different than other parts of the NIH because 80%, almost 85% of the funds that we get, and that's about a half a billion dollars a year now, 85% of our funds stay here on the campus. That is, they bring you PubMed, dbGaP, GenBank, the Sequence Read Archives. And so they're used to fulfill, to stimulate, to ensure the, the research operations of the world. So we have a smaller part of our, of our portfolio that focuses directly on the conduct of research. And that I, I shepherd very carefully. The most innovative, the most likely to be generalizable, reusable, scalable alternatives. While we may have research projects that address a health problem of concern, you'll hear a little engineering in this, they must address it in a way that looks for the reusable parts of that solution. Not, we're not here to, to cure cancer, we're here to build the models that may help others cure cancer, but can be used for many kinds of cancers. Thank you. You mentioned um, the uh, bias and the integrity of some of your systems. So we have another question um, from uh, what was submitted. So Mike uh, Karankowski, who's the Director of Interprofessional Education asks, can you provide insight into how the National Library of Medicine interfaces with global informatics institutes to ensure health intelligence remains free of bias and maintains the highest standards of ethics and integrity? Well, I was hoping that question would be a little bit easier for me, but it's <laughs> truly not. Um, let me let me preface this by saying, first of all, the NIH in general and the National Library of Medicine in particular recognizes that science is global, that the coronavirus did not need to come through passport control to get here, and that our understanding of responding to personal and public health challenges of the future requires that we collect broadly the knowledge of health across the world, not just the English language, United States generated knowledge. So we have a deep commitment, and I can talk to you about some of our very specific uh, commitments about globalization of genomic data and pathogen surveillance, which will, are increasingly becoming critical, not only to research, but also to public health. But let me, let me pause for a minute and say, when we talk about ethics and we talk about bias, we have to remember that inter country, interprofession, and maybe even within family differences about values may be inadvertently labeled as bias or may be inadvertently um, uh, uh, characterizing or privileging one view of the world over another. So when we talk about making data or algorithms or analytics bias-free, or we discuss the, the challenges to um, making sure they're ethical, we have to recognize that the ethics vary across the world. Ethics are systems of decision-making. And the ethics that I make as a relatively uh, um, accomplished, well-supported, confident middle-class woman might be different than the ethics of a 14-year-old in West Milwaukee who's having her best, her second baby and wants to do the very best for that baby. So we have to recognize that the concept of principled approaches to understanding and, and analytics that expose relevant aspects of individuals is what we're shooting for, not necessarily adherence to a single ethical model or a single way of describing a disease. 
Um, this requires that we consider how to make F analytics, particularly advanced analytics, much more transparent. We need to help specifically our clinicians, but frankly, our researchers and our consumers who are losing, using our consumer health tools. We have to help them understand and be able to see what are the premises upon which this particular algorithm was built and how do they fit the situation where you're trying to use it. Uh, we do need to recognize that the, the United States now is quite committed to open data, yet open data might inadvertently expose a migrant farm worker to being deported. So openness of our data and data sharing, even in and of, its, excuse me, in and of itself, is not a, a pure good, but rather requires tempering, requires thoughtfulness. So how do we do this? Um, we try several things. First of all, we have a network of the National Library of Medicine. This is 8,000 points of presence around the country, academic health science libraries, public libraries, hospital libraries, where our tools, our uh, access to our resources, our training opportunities are present and can be reached into the everyday lives of clinicians, patients, and researchers. And we use that in part to provide not the answer to what is an ethical uh, algorithm, but the strategies for determining the ethical premises of an algorithm. So we try to equip our publics, of which there are many, not only with the ideas of how to determine what is whether this is this particular analytic strategy is right for you in your case with your patient, but also to understand what biases may be built into it, because many times we don't realize that algorithms that agree with us might be as biased as algorithms that disagree with us. So we're trying to enrich the ability of individuals to use information better. Thank you. So our next question comes, was submitted by Abigail Gobin, an associate professor and information services and liaison librarian um, down at, here in our UIC library. And the question is, how do we prevent abuse or misuse of open data related to underrepresented minorities? And some of what you've just spoken about in terms of bias and differences, certainly we are very focused on our underrepresented minorities and would love to hear about how do we prevent that misuse? The United States has been a lot more concerned about uh, preventing misuse of data as it's acquired, as opposed to preventing use, misuse of data as it is used. And so one of the personal things that I would, would argue for is that we need to look at the data lifespan and to understand what misuse means along the way. Um, selecting the, uh, the right data set for the right question that was generated by the right set of people is, is a good starting point. Um, we do know that that data tell stories. And if, if someone started off the story with the ending, the conclusion, the last chapter, that helping uh, helping to reveal the the use of data for purposes, as, as if we would say we fit the model to the data or data to the model, we want to make sure that the data, we let the data tell the story, but yet that story is often characterized is often constrained by the worldview that we have. So understanding the interpretation, understanding the worldview. Now let's go, you're asking a very specific question though, community or a, a thoughtless community. Um, those are questions that can, that relate not only to the data that is generated, but to the manner in which the data are used and using and presenting data through dialogue as, as compared to presenting data through reports as a strategy to address that. I've been struck by work that I did uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the early 2000s that continues to be important. And much of it was characterized by the statement, nothing about me without me. And so as we seek to res be responsive to communities in need and to better understand the communities as they wish to be understood, we need to engage with the communities as early as possible to blend that which we bring as professionals and that which they bring with the experiential knowledge of their neighborhood together. Um, not privileging one perspective or another, but actually recognizing that they're two sides of the same coin. I've, been, I've spent most of my career 
in an area people would call consumer health informatics. And it's always made me crazy that the idea has been that, that people will tell us their problems and we will give them an answer. When in fact, we don't often even have the ears to understand the stories that people are telling us. So the nothing about me without me in terms of it's being a strategy to prevent misuse of or inappropriate characterization of communities of disparity um, really begins long before we need the data, long before we wanna build the report, when we first establish the partnership with the community. When we first recognize that words that make sense to health professionals may not make sense in the same way to the individual. And in fact, the both and idea, the person is both having a myocardial infarction and a heart attack means that we have to understand that we have to incorporate into our clinical practice and our clinical understandings that personalistic view of, of interpretation. Um, I, the, one of the things that, that makes me absolutely crazy is the phrase correcting misperceptions. Now, definitely there are some incorrect information, certainly all over the internet, and hopefully not too much in my own repositories here. Incorrect information where there's a factual underlying basis, whether it's physiology or, or psychology, must be addressed by professionals. I absolutely agree with that. But imprecise interpretations or alternative, excuse me, alternative gatherings of different data to create an understanding of a solution, that requires that we, we understand the person's motive power before we decide that they have a misperception of the data. Um, early on, uh, we were working, we, my research team was working with people with AIDS and one of the information tools we had was to ha how to prevent a fever. And we worked with a colleague clinician who said, you can't prevent fevers, fever and natural body response. And where we, we had to get to was to recognize that preventing dehydration or all the factors that could lead a person with an autoimmune or immune disease to develop an, an ability to thermoregulate is different than the preventing the, the fever response to an infection, which is a therapeutic response. So better understanding of the words we use together, better understanding of the language. Um, I'd like to believe that all people are about good, but frankly, I've noticed from growing up in West Philadelphia, living in Wisconsin, and now here in DC, that what's good on my block may not be what's good on your block. And understanding that the, we, we have to build a capacity for, uh, it, as we do at the one NLM concept, for the one community concept, that, that neither privileges one street over another, nor dismisses the needs of one area over another. I think that's aspirational, but I don't think it's too much to try to strive for. So Abigail has one um, last question in her uh, questioning and um, from a librarian perspective with the open you know, data and all the resources and obligations. And the question is, how do we recognize and support the more traditional skills of librarians of this metadata and you know, searching and information literacy, like from a more of the librarian professional perspective. Your thoughts on that? We have never needed librarians more than we've needed them now. And on many of the skills from organizing information to attaching metadata or the terms that describe the data set or locating and searching are skills that are, 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 are requirements that are so incredibly complex now that it is almost impossible to imagine a world without librarians. And yet, when we see university budgets or hospital budgets, the first thing to go is, well, what are the librarians doing? They're just bringing us stuff and we can get it from Google now, so why bother? So part of it is, 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 is helping our um, uh, impact assessments become more visible in the discussions of large scale budgets. But what I, I would say is that the more traditional skills of librarians are exactly what we need right now. We need to be able to explode a question into various dimensions so we can work with a patron to find out exactly what are you looking for. We need to be able to help a person efficiently sort resources. Um, any of you who've done a PubMed search in the last 10 years has probably gotten 40 pages of citations. And if you're like most of our patrons, you haven't gone past the second page. But if the, if the citation you needed was four pages in, how would we get it to you? So our researchers got together to build a machine learning model that would use a concept called relevance-based ranking. That is sort of the same way that uh, Amazon suggests, if you bought that dress, you want these shoes. 
we say people who read this article also read that article. We try to bring together. Now, it's not quite that simple, they keep telling me. So they, won't, they don't like me to explain it that way. But basically, if you look at PubMed now, you can get your citations in two different ways. Reverse chronological order, what's most recent, or relevance-based ranking. And hopefully, the pieces that you want come to the top more quickly. So that's how we take librarians' ideas of the kind of search a librarian would do, automate them, and make them accessible to the world. So speaking on, um, again, the library and the needs um, in terms of librarians and, and all of those uh, aspects, we have a question submitted from attendees by Susan Dunn, Department Head and Associate Professor, College of Nursing. Um, and it's actually two questions. <laughs> but the first one is, how has the trend for increased remote work of scientists and clinicians impacted their library needs and their use of the National Library of Medicine? And then our second question is, how has your nursing education and training prepared you for your role as director? Wow. Um, I'm going to try to bring these two together pretty efficiently. Um, uh, libraries are places and they're spaces. So as a physical place, our library has actually, we, we are not a traditional lending library. We're a resource or reference library. Um, but we do have over uh, 45 million different pieces of um, publications, books, papers. I have six miles of shelving in my building. And so we do have to, we do have things here, but increasingly no one comes here to use them. So we have to use electronic strategies to, to send resources into the community. Not everything is digitized and not everything should be digitized. It's, as, it's very important to note that in the 1870s, there were two important books written for maternal child care, one for obstetrics and one for nursing care of the pregnant and birthing mother. The obstetric textbook was 14 inches by 12 inches by six inches. The nursing textbook was a pamphlet, six by four by a half an inch. And just seeing the physical artifact reflects so many other aspects of the experience. So we will always need physical artifacts. But remote work um, requires us to work where, from wherever we are. So we need secure transmission. We need to make sure that our materials as we're sharing them appropriately attend to the copyright issues related to the materials that we respect the, the, uh, the ownership strategy. We need to build communities. We need to use the electronic communities in ways that we did not use before uh, because we could walk down the hall and say, hey, take a look at this chart and look at this diagram. Can you, can you tell me what you see in this picture? So using um, more tools to create conversation around using the information is a really important part of the library. Um, we, while we were on maximum telework, which was for over two years, the National Library of Medicine received 700 boxes of journals and books that we've had to sort and catalog and get into our shelves so they can be used if individuals request them. We're pretty much done, by the way, but it took us a while to get all of those out. So we still, we had to have people in place, yet we recognize that not every request for interlibrary loan cannot be filled by the National Library of Medicine alone. Last year, we filled 150,000 requests for interlibrary loan, but our networks around the country, our regional medical libraries, filled another million requests. So we have, the, we have to rely on the network of resources. Um, I would say the library itself was probably most, best poised for the, the remote work and the pandemic because we were already used to working at a distance. We already knew how to take advantage of knowledge that was distributed and build, build strategies to pull it together. Um, for our clinicians, probably the most important thing that has come out is the need to have information in the moment, not even in the minute, it's the moment. And so our resources at the National Library of Medicine, particularly our PubMed resources, is not going to be searched by a busy ER nurse or a doc getting ready to, to deal with a problem that's come up in the middle of a surgery. So we need to make our resources available so that commercial companies can build on top of the data we collect, on top of the resources we collect, to create in the moment resources for clinicians to use. So we see ourselves less as the point of contact, more as the part as a part of a process of information flow into healthcare and discovery. Thanks, Patty. You're talking about a lot of um... Uh, integration, networking, collaboration, and adaption that we've had to accommodate uh, because of the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic has changed healthcare 
um, dramatically. How do you see kind of the emerging priorities for this interdisciplinary approach moving forward right now where we are? I'm, I'm going to answer that from a very per personal perspective. Um, if we could move our information management strategies away from the accounting, that is how much did it cost, how many people were involved with it, and away from the protection, that is, did I document enough to make sure that if I get sued, there's going to be a, a, a history, to an information aggregation, information in the moment for action, we would be in a much better place. I, I recognize the accountability we have to the public for making sure that care is given properly. And I'm in no way suggesting that we should in any way try to uh, use our information to hide in pro inappropriate care or incorrect care. But I am saying we need to move our clinicians to a model that says, here is information, it will help you heal. Here is information, it will bring you connection to your patients. And, and that idea that information goes forward from the clinical moment, as opposed to gets recorded about the clinical moment, is really the place I would like to see us go. Now, how can the National Library of Medicine do that? We can fund research about how information is used in practice. We can fund demonstration projects as we did with the University of Cincinnati, where we helped to, uh, we, we provided support for an investigator to build the pathway of information flow for children aging out of foster care so that information from the courts, from the foster families, from the care providers could be made available to the, to the, the adolescent as he or she turned 18 and needed that. So we, we look for the creativity of our investigators to tell us how we can build, build better tools to bring information forward from as opposed to backing up the care encounter. Patty, another question from our attendees. Um, we have a question from Darlene Evans, our, our Associate Chief Nursing Officer, Clinical Practice and Professional Development, Nursing Quality and Compliance, and Nursing Evidence-Based uh, Practice and Research. Um, Darlene's question, um, again, it's another two-parter. Um, what are you seeing across the country to support greater evidence of nursing research and improve the collaboration and an integration of data across medical and clinical professions? And then does your strategic plan include how to increase and make aware of an interprofessional approach rather than the traditional research provider physician-based focus? Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up against a, a, a monolithic financial incentive structure that's really challenging to break apart. And so the idea of moving research into an interprofessional model really does requiring us to take, take a step back to understand basically the economics of research and how research is funded, how research has perverse incentive structures, how research um, enables uh, uh, um, uh, the efficient study of one part of the care process, maybe overlooking the study of other parts. So we have, we have to take that head on, I believe. Um, the National Library of Medicine supports something called the Unifar Unified Medical Language System. This is a set of terminologies. Many of you have seen these. SNOMED, CPT codes, LOINC, um, RxNorm, NANDA, uh, the Nursing Intervention Classification. These terms all provide an ontological perspective on the patient and the words themselves are not semantically equivalent. So anxiety from a nursing diagnosis perspective and anxiety in the DSM-4, I guess it is now, or five we're at, um, are two fundamentally different concepts. So our, our computer scientists, our, net, our linguistics experts have built um, what we can call the semantic network, the interoperability of these languages at the concept level, not at the word level. So the tools are in place. We provide these tools to support, for example, the understanding and pricing for complex care. Is this person's diabetes getting better? Have they recovered from their cardiac event? Um, also for uh, pricing for quality. What is the right strategies? And this is called our, our value set authority. So we, we, we're trying to put in place the tools that can make information more useful, more reflective in, of interprofessional perspectives, more and less uh, hierarchical. Um, what we haven't done as well is figure out how to incentivize the use of these tools. So we work with the, the, some of the electronic health records companies to make sure that the terminologies underlying the care record systems actually have this interactive. We're currently working with the CDC to better understand how do we build a bridge between personal care 
which is what most clinical care is, and public health. Uh, much of this requires policy change. It's not simply a technology or a practice change. So along the way, the National Library of Medicine partners with uh, our sister agencies, such as the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT, or the CDC, or CMS, or the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, to make sure that the, the data used for care is reflective of the complexities of care. This isn't always easy because dominant models come into play, Terminolo terminological shorthand sometimes it could circumscribes an understanding. Um, and we work very hard to make sure these crosswalks between concepts stays present. I think that's um, really helpful on the kind of the input that goes into the database. I've got a practical question from uh, Joseph uh, Cecil, one of our uh, directors of patient care services that he's asking for advice on someone that's new to the National Libraries of Medicine and uh, the, to the database, and how would you recommend to maximize end user experience? Well, I'd say start with your librarian. Um, and if you don't have a librarian, get your boss to get you one, because this is a practice need across many, many disciplines. But the, the, the important piece of getting into our databases is to come in with a question, or at least a statement or a direction. If you open a database and start exploring, you're going to find stuff, but it might not be what you're looking for. And you might find stuff that doesn't get you wouldn't interpret quite properly. But we do have the National Library of Medicine has biological databases, has molecular databases, we have clinical trials, we have literature. So you want to, the, the, the assistants, when I say work with the librarian, I, I think they have the best skills for helping people refine questions, but colleagues would also to figure out what is it you're really after and what do you want to do with the information. I believe supervisors and managers have the right to know what their staff propose to do with information were they to provide them the time and the ability to actually make that information accessible. So changing information into a, from a consuming commodity, a consumed commodity into an operational tool for practice really requires supervisors and management engagement. Um, one step though, we, we, have, um, we have within our PubMed system, we have a number of tutorials and classes that are available online. And those, those walk people through the first time through a process. Um, within clinicaltrials.gov, which is our, our database of over 400,000 clinical studies, many of which are actively recruiting, there's a, there's a help desk section right at the very beginning, how to search for a trial. So making use of some of these tools. Most people were finding they're like a human touch. They like a human to participate. So we run um, Terrific Tuesdays, where there's a one minute uh, uh, training from the NCBI about how to access one of their databases or something new in one of their databases. So signing up for our, our if you will, our push information that should, will show up in your mailbox easily could be really quite helpful. I'm going to close by asking anyone who's listening to think about, if you're at all interested in learning new ways, to please go to our network of the National Library of Medicine. That's nnlm.gov, National Network of the Library of Medicine. And if you want to call me, I'll give it to you over the email if you need. Um, and there you'll find a whole list of, of tools for preparing data management and sharing plans, which our investigators are going to need over the next couple of months to understanding how to provide good information for your patients. Increasingly, our, cons our consumers are our computers. So we have a pathway into Medline Plus, which is our, our, our community level, patient level data set from most electronic health record systems. So we can deliver directly to the patient information tailored to that person. Finding out how to work with your IT systems to get our information into the hands of your clinicians, I think is the best way to go. Patty, great answers. And, and sometimes the hardest part is getting started, right? Um, yep. So that was very helpful. I want to remind people to and encourage you to please submit questions in the chat. And we do have one that I'd like to share. Um, it's coming from Dr. Terry Vandenhoek, who is our department chair for emergency medicine. And he writes, the effectiveness of information is so dependent on trust. And as you can imagine in his role as an emergency room physician as well, his question is, how do we use information most effectively to promote trust in our patients. Oh, wow, that's great. Um, I like that structuring of it also. Um, we, it, we begin by information in, as a part of a dialogue. And, and um, I, I think to, to hand a person a fact sheet or even to state things to an individual and then say, good luck, please follow my directions is not enough. We need to, to, uh, to find 
ways to transfer that information. Part of the transfer is helping people understand that there could be multiple perspectives that are equally correct. What is the right way to manage a person on a low sodium diet? Well, there's a couple of different strategies to do that. So we, we need to help people understand the uncertainty around some of our information and to recognize that the uncertainty doesn't mean it's incorrect. It means it gives them the opportunity to pick the information that fits in their care situation. Now, having recently spent time in an emergency room with a fractured arm, um, I will tell you that the last thing I wanted was information. I wanted morphine. I wanted something to help my pain, and I wanted this to be fixed quickly. So the question that I would respond back to, particularly, and I got great ER care, by the way. It was fabulous care. Um, but the question I would say back is, how do we define, the, if you will, the boundaries of our care system? and when we will provide information to people. So when I was there, I fractured both my radius and ulna. I actually didn't want anybody teaching me much at those moments, but I, what I needed to know afterwards, I needed a follow-up piece. So, so how do we think about reconnecting with the person later on? How do we manage that in communities where coming to the ER in the first place is such a huge step that you may not get a correct name or address or phone number to be able to make the follow-up. So we have to do, we have to find ways to provide new pathways to information in our community. Um, I, I believe that at the point, certainly at the point of emergency care, information has to be utilitarian. It has to be useful. It has to fit into the person's um, needs at the moment. And in those cases, I believe sometimes we are remiss by wanting people to understand why the information matters rather than helping them understand that the information matters. Uh, we, we, Dr. Collins, Francis Collins, our recent director, uh, was quick to point out that NIH really missed the missed a key lesson in the beginning of the pandemic because we thought by telling people the science behind the vaccine, it would help people bring the vaccine into their lives. And I would say, although it's challenging to do in an, in an emergency situation, somehow we need to understand what are people's skills at bringing information into their lives. So given that we provide them with trusted information, accurate, um, aligned with community values, appropriate for their age and stage in life, how do we then understand how they incorporate it? And that's where I would go back to a very classic nursing experience, which we call the teach back method. Okay, I've given you this piece of information. Tell me how you'll use it. And if, you, if you're not sure how you'll use it, tell me what problems you might have in using this. Recently, we've been working with people trying to manage low sodium diets. And I will tell you, when you send a person into a grocery store and say, buy the food you need for your two gram sodium diet, when the packages have multiple servings in them and the amount of, of you that you eat in a single day is more than is in a package, it's, these people have to do a lot of math in their heads to get through that. So we need to help people become instrumentally valuing of the information we provide them. We have another question in the chat by uh, Dean Collins, our Dean of the College of Nursing. And um, she shares in a recent podcast, Francis Collins said that we should have had our own version of flooding the system with truth instead of having the system completely flooded with lies. How does the NLM help with this endeavor? Um, there, the question, um, challenges us to rethink how we are distributing information. We often distribute information on demand, whether it's our demand as clinicians that patients need to know this or their demand that they want something from us. But we could take a step back, and this is what I believe Francis is arguing for. We could become proactive in using a wide variety of channels to get information out into the community. Um, NLM distributes its own information, including information about how to use our resources and what our, our research is about through Instagram, through Twitter, through, um, we do have podcasts. We also have uh, cartoons. We have comics. We have uh, videos for people to see because we need multiple pathways. But Francis was speaking not only of, of going early and using multiple pathways, but he was talking about the volume of information we give. And um, I, I want to point out, by the way, that Dr. Collins is speaking as a private citizen now, not as a federal employee. So he has a little more leeway than all of us do. 
But I, it is important to remember that we, we're, we're stuck at a conundrum with science right now where we don't want to let anything out until we're sure it's valid, right, truthful, uh, uh, reproducible, et cetera, et cetera. And yet during the pandemic, we learned that we got to go today because something that is needed was probably needed yesterday. So how do we find that? And that goes back to my, my thinking that, that one of the most important things clinicians can do is develop and pe- in lay people as well as colleagues, the ability to understand the uncertainty inherent in biological and clinical information and what to do about it. So I, I believe there's no uncertainty about the coronavirus and, and I believe there's absolutely no uncertainty about the vaccine. However, the uncertainty that someone may feel is not about that vaccine, but about vaccines as a federal control over individuals. So how do we move to their what their level of uncertainty is about and address that? Uh, personally, uh, I believe that um, the, 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 we, the, the, the making a better use of marketing, of market approaches to distributing health information will stand us in good stead as a sector. I'm not sure I would recommend it for any individual hospital. I think I might be a little more targeted in, in a health system or a hospital, but, but we certainly have um, opportunities to meet and reach people in their vernacular, in their ways of understanding much better uh, than we do. And if you I know that in parts of Chicago uh, has been involved with the SEAL program, the Community Engagement and Alliance Strategy for Ending COVID uh, and Enhancing COVID Testing. And one of the things we learned there is we need to give in, as professionals, give information out that then gets moved into the vernacular of the community. And that requires trust at the level of the information transmission before it gets to the information user. And that requires building a relationship over time. It's not something that happens in the moment. We have about five more minutes left. I encourage people to submit additional questions into the chat or if there are any additional questions from any of our um, moderators and um, those of us on the screen. I have a question. I, if I oh, could. sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone else want to say something? I, I just, there's a question from Denise Kent in the Q&A also, but why don't you ask your question first, Jerry, and then we'll, get, we'll close with that one. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think, uh, as you know, um, we're we're um, we're we've, we're really benefiting from this conversation. We're asking a lot of questions. Part of the things we also want to know is how, how do you, as a director, work with other directors? Uh, very about that. You have a lot of leaders. How do all the leaders work together? Um, well, you have to imagine putting all those leaders in one room and how big of a room we need to be able to accommodate all those egos. This is the brightest, smartest group of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I visit the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is incredible. Um, what we we do is we, we and we meet, as I said, we meet together every Tuesday uh, for, an, or sorry, every Thursday for an hour and a half. And we learn how to leverage each other's work, not totally cooperative. We've got some competitive things going on. We're trying to build an IT uh, d- d- digital future plan right now that's required requiring us to rethink how we make choices. But we we do, um, we begin by a level of mutual respect. I mean, I would say Larry Tabak, our acting director and Francis, our previous director, really emphasized one-to-one engagement between directors to build partnerships. Um, there are, we have the haves and the have-nots. My operation is a half billion dollars a year. Cancer is 7 billion. They're bigger than we are and they have different, different needs and different rights. But understanding where we have common needs or common, common uh, operations has been a really big help. Um, I would say that about almost half of my job is outside of the NLM across the campus. And as Francis said, from the first time I got here, finding ways to solve problems that other ICs experience, inter- institutes and centers experience. So we've invested a lot of our effort in making our repositories like clinicaltrials.gov easier for people to use. We've invested a lot of effort in becoming leaders and uh, not only thought leaders, but really technical supports to using cloud instances for data management and storage. We've spent a great deal of our effort in something called the, the Research Authorization Service or the RAS, which will allow for a single sign-on so you don't have to sign into every single database individually. So solving problems for people. Um, and I would the other thing I would say is having dinner with them once in a while is important. So throughout the pandemic, a group of eight or nine IC directors used to get together about every six weeks and we show our artwork or we talk about what crafts we're working on and we show our households to people. And that connection 
gave us a conversation point that was really important. Team building amongst yeah. our peers and with, with our leaders. Um, and I, I can see the, the last question in the chat and may, maybe a nice one to wrap up is, what's your style of leadership and how that's evolved? I know we touched on that a little bit um, in the beginning, but um, wrap it up for us. That's uh, a great question. When I, when I first came, especially when I came out of, of, of a state government operation, I had learned a lot about how to manage up and how to manage down. When I came to the federal government, someone told me the most important thing is to manage across, connect to your colleagues. And I would say my leadership style has been become less uh, idiosyncratic, less me focused and more partnership focused, more uh, finding allies around problems and challenges, uh, using my colleagues to help me solve problems. But cultivating my level of peer relationships has been a big, big shift since I came to NIH. None of us are islands, right? We really right. need everybody more than we definitely think and definitely know. Um, and it's that collaboration. And we're doing a lot of that here these days, not only with COVID, but with some of our initiatives in terms of our strategic um, focus, both at the College of Medicine and certainly here at the hospital. So, um, well, uh, I'm gonna go ahead then and, and wrap us up if I may. and. Um, just say we're, we're going to go ahead. I know that we had something sent to you. Dr. Brennan, I know you're coming back, Patty, from yes. um, being out for a couple of days. But a family um, wedding. Not, it was not a health problem. It was a family wedding. You know what? I know we weren't at the same wedding, but I was at a wedding this weekend, yes. too. So um, anyways, <laughs> um, Eileen, if you can, please switch. Thank you. Wow. So I know we don't have one in hand, but this is a really nice picture of our UI Health UIC Distinguished Scholar Series and um, presented to you, Patricia Flatley Brennan, today. Um, and so um, it is my distinct pleasure and honor on this special day to commemorate this virtual event and Hopefully, we will see you in person sometime soon uh, to present this Distinguished Scholar Series Award in honor of your leadership and learning from you on how you think about team-directed leadership, um, why you pursued your vision, and how to apply your insights to improve health and a strategy to understand. And as you said, nothing about me without me. So congratulations, Patty, and thank you again uh, on your award. And we have learned so much from you and appreciate um, all that you have shared with us today. Thank you so much.